Please open your Bibles this morning to the epistle of Jude. We'll continue walking through the epistle of Jude this morning, focusing on verses 17 and 18. At Balfour, we affirm the truth of 2 Timothy 3.16, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Let's pray together this morning. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity we've had to worship you. I pray that our worship has been done in spirit and in truth. I pray now, Lord, as we open up your word, that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts, Lord, would bring honor and glory to you, that they would be acceptable in your sight. I pray that you would use your word to draw the lost to yourself, that they might be saved and have eternal life with you. Lord, I pray and ask you to help me to communicate your word. I am a weak vessel in need of your exceedingly abundant grace. I trust, Lord, that it is sufficient, and I pray and ask you to make your strength perfect in my weakness. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's look at the epistle of Jude, beginning at verse number one. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts. In these things they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are spots in your love feasts, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. 
So let's look to the Bible this morning with ears to hear and a heart to obey. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look to your Bible, verse 17. But you. Now Jude has just described these certain men for us in verse 16 as grumblers, men who were quick to communicate their discontentment as complainers, men who were quick to find fault and express their unhappiness, as walking according to their own lusts, men who ordered their lives in a way that did not honor God, as speaking great swelling words, men who were filled with arrogance, as flattering people to gain advantage, men who were showing favoritism to benefit themselves. But Jude begins verse 17, but you. It's a contrast between the certain men who had crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, the ungodly men who were turning the grace of our God into lewdness and denying our only Lord God, the, excuse me, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Jude is contrasting those men with those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Christ Jesus. Let me ask you a question this morning. Is there a contrast between you and the ungodly? Could it be written of you? Could all the listing of the ungodly attributes and characteristics of those who are far from God, could they be listed? And then the words, but you. Is there a contrast between you and the ungodly? Or have you been deceived? Is your life marked by the works of the flesh? The Bible says in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Are you here today? Do you dismiss the clear evidences in your life of an ungodly life and hold on to a prayer that you prayed when you were younger, asking Jesus into your heart? If the works of the flesh describe you, I plead with you. Examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Jesus said in John 3, 3, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Read 1 John. What a wonderful letter that we find in the Bible. 1 John. There you'll find what J.C. Ryle calls the six great marks of a born-again Christian. No habitual sinning. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 9, whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Next, believing in Christ. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 1, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. Third, practicing righteousness. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 29, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Number four, loving other Christians. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 14, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Number five, overcoming the world. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 4 and 5, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And then number six, keeping oneself pure. 
The Bible says in 1 John 5, 18, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. If you read through 1 John, and you see those six great marks of a born-again Christian, and they do not describe you. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day. Now Jude has gone to great lengths so far in this epistle to let us see that these false teachers that it infiltrated the church, that they are outside the kingdom of God. They may have come in and assembled, but they were outside the kingdom of God. Now Jude reminds the faithful once again of their position inside the kingdom of God. Look at verse 17. But you, beloved, Webster's 1828 defines beloved as loved, greatly loved, dear to the heart. As you read through the New Testament, you'll see that word beloved. It's used to describe Christians over and over again. By describing those who are called, sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ as beloved, Jude is reminding the church that they are dear to the heart of God. God. Now, if you're here this morning and you have repented and believed the gospel, that Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, if you're here this morning having confessed with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believed in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you have been saved. You are loved. You are greatly loved loved. You are near to the heart of God. As you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints, as you do that, remember that you are dear to the heart of God. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. No one, and understand this from the scriptures, no one is saved by good works. The Christian is saved by grace through faith for good works. There's tremendous harm if you rotate those two. We're not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith for good works. When God reconciled you to himself through Jesus Christ, he made you a new creation. God began a process of sanctification in your life. The Bible says in Philippians 2, 12 through 13, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Remember this wonderful promise from God to the Christian. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Look to your Bible once again, verse 17. But you, beloved, remember the words. Webster's 1828 defines remember as to have in the mind an idea which had been in the mind before and which recurs to the mind without effort. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 1, the church is having a prayer meeting in the upper room. A replacement for Judas is needed. 
the qualifications for this replacement are outlined in Acts 1, 21 and 22. The Bible says, Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all this time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Two men were brought forward. A man named Matthias was numbered with the eleven apostles. In Acts 9, we see Saul, a man that we will come to know as Paul. He was on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians. The Bible tells us as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Paul encountered the risen Lord Jesus. We read that he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. The Lord Jesus sent a man named Ananias to baptize Paul. The Bible says in Acts 9, 15, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Now, as we see in the old, or excuse me, as we see in the New Testament, there were others who were sent with the message of our Lord Jesus Christ. But I believe Jude is likely referring to the twelve apostles and Paul when he refers here to the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now before we consider the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, I want us to consider the word remember a little further. Please turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 24, verse 1. Luke chapter 24, verse 1. If you found your place, please say amen. Luke 24 records the events that took place beginning on the third day after Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and he was buried. As we read here in Luke 24, pay close attention to the two men in shining garments and what they instruct the women to do. So let's begin at verse number 1. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments, then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Now look at verse number 8. And they remembered his words. And they remembered his words. The women made a connection between what they were experiencing, which was the death, burial, and now the empty tomb that they have encountered. They made the connection to that and with what Jesus had spoken to them. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, on three separate occasions, record the words of Jesus as he foretold of his death and resurrection. The Bible says in Matthew 16, 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third time day. The Bible says in Mark 9, 30 through 31, they, they departed from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know it, 
For he taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men and women, and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. The Bible says in Luke 18, 31 and 30 through 33, Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. The women's understanding of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus depended upon them remembering the words of Jesus. The first century church's understanding of the infiltration of these false teachers into the church depended upon their remembering the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. As the infiltration of the church by false teachers continues into the 21st century, continues into the present day, our understanding of this infiltration of the, of the church by false teachers depends upon our remembering the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you see there in verse number 17 in Jude, that word that's translated remember, it's a command. It is a command from the apostle written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the church. This is something we are to obey. It is a command to us in the Greek tense that's used in this word. It emphasizes the urgency behind the command. So as we see this command, it's not simply, hey, remember. If you think about it, remember. No, it is Remember, drawing our attention to the urgency that we faced. The first century church needed to remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Their contending earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints, required it. The 21st century church needs to remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our contending earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints, requires it. Just as Jesus forewarned his apostles of his death and resurrection, the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ forewarned the church about the infiltration of the false teachers. Please return in your Bibles back to the epistle of Jude, and let's look at verse 18. Jude reminds the church of the specific warning. So look to your Bible, verse 18. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. Jude describes these false teachers as mockers. Webster's 1828 defines the word mock as to deride, to laugh at, to ridicule, to treat with scorn or contempt. Now, mockers will view themselves as high above everyone else. They will ridicule others from their self-appointed lofty positions. Roman soldiers mock our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Matthew 27, 28 through 31, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and they took the reed and struck him on the head. When they had mocked him, they took the robe off him put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. Jude also describes these false teachers as walking according to their own ungodly 
lusts. These men were driven by their ungodly desires. These men were rejecting God. They did not want to live as He prescribes. These men were ordering their lives in a way that did not honor God. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. As you choose how to order your life, remember what the Bible says in Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Look to your Bibles, verse 18. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. The last time refers to the period between Jesus' first coming and His second coming. It refers to the time period between John 1.14 and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And when Jesus fulfills the promise He made in John 14, 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to Myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The phrase, last time, is another way to say the last days. It is the time period in which Jude and the recipients of this letter were living. It is the time period in which each one of us are living today. Now, I hold the position that 2 Peter was written before Jude. Peter warned the church that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. Jude, in his epistle, he sounds the alarm that the mockers, walking according to their own ungodly lusts, had infiltrated the church. These men who had ordered their lives according to their ungodly desires, they were living against the very purposes of God. They were the very definition of what it means to be ungodly. Now, Jesus warned us that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. He said in Matthew 7, 15 through 20, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Paul warned the church that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. He exhorted the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, 28-31, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which He purchased with His own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch. And remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul exhorted Timothy. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, 
traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Peter warned that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. The Bible says in 2 Peter 1-3, through 3, But there were also false prophets among the, the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them, who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. Church, if you will look around at the world today, if you will look around at the false teachers who have risen up, you will see that the prophecy that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts, it is being fulfilled right before our very eyes. So for the Christian, don't be surprised by false teachers. Prepare for them by reading and studying the Bible. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, 16-17, all Scripture is given by God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do not neglect the whole counsel of God. Drink deeply from the well of Scripture. Read both the Old Testament through the New Testament. Begin in Genesis and read through Revelation, receive the word with all readiness. Search the scriptures daily to find out whether what you read and hear are so. When false teachers hijack a verse or a concept and they distort what the Bible says about it, you will be able to identify their deception if you know what the Scripture teaches. Now, an appeal to the unsaved. The word translated remember is a command. We've already looked at that. This is a command. And the Greek tense emphasizes here that there is an urgency behind the command. The Bible says in Mark 1, 14 through 15, now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. In Mark 1.15, those words repent and believe are also commands. There was and is an urgency behind Jesus' command to repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus is commanding the rebellious sinner to repent and believe in the gospel. To reject his command is to reject the one who gives it. If you're here today and you have never repented and believed the gospel, let me tell you about two other men who are in your exact position. Their choices determined how they would spend eternity. On the day Jesus died for the sins of the world, the Bible says in Luke 23, there were also two others, criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. The Bible says in Matthew 27, 44, even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. The Bible says in Luke 23, 39, then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. 
God begins to bring conviction over the second criminal. The Bible says in Luke 23, 40 through 42, but the other answering rebuked him saying, do you not even fear God seeing you are under the same condemnation and we indeed justly for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. There's that word, remember, again. As that criminal hung on that cross next to Jesus, he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He hung on that cross trusting by faith in Jesus. Believing that Jesus was who he said he was. That man was hanging on that cross because of his wicked deeds. He was going to die very soon. He did not have the time nor the opportunity to make up for all the bad things he had done. By doing good works. He simply wanted Jesus to remember him when Jesus came into his kingdom. What would you expect the response to be in that moment? What a contrast now between the response we might expect and how Jesus responds. The Bible says in Luke 23, 43, And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. This man hung on that cross, desperately needing the mercy and grace of God. He found it when he looked on to Jesus. There were two men hanging on crosses that day beside Jesus, one on his right, one on his left. One of the men looked upon Jesus mockingly. He died in his sin and received everlasting condemnation. The other looked upon Jesus in faith. He was forgiven of his sin and he received everlasting life. If you're here today, you've never done it. If you will look upon Jesus for salvation, God will save you from your sin and death. I appeal to you, repent and believe the gospel. That Christ died for your sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. God promises you that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus said in Matthew 11, 28, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus said in John 6, 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Come to Jesus. He will not turn you away. He will receive you. We'll have a time of prayer and invitation. As the piano plays, if you bow your head, whatever discussions you need to have with God this morning, take the time to do that. You can do it right there in your seat. You can come up to the altar and pray. You can come up here. I'll be happy to pray with you if you want someone to pray with you. But take this time. Reflect upon God. Reflect upon His words, especially the importance of remember the words. Heavenly Father, thank You for the testimony that You give us in the Scriptures. Thank you for reminding us over and over again that Christ would die for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He would be buried, that He would rise again the third day according to the Scriptures. Thank you for showing us that He has ascended back to your right hand and will return, will return in the day of judgment. I pray, Lord, that we would hide your words in our heart, that we might not sin against you, Please help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray if there's anyone, Lord, that does not know you, has not repented and believed the gospel, that I pray they would do that today. 
and not turn their back from you any longer. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.